Okay, so let me start. Uh, we're going to talk about memory systems, challenges, and opportunities. I'll, I'd like to give you a broad view of what are the big challenges and opportunities we have in systems uh, today. And memory is a huge part of it. That's why this course starts with memory. Later on, we're going to talk about computation also. But if you think about how things are changing today, uh, it's really the data and memory that's their big bottleneck. That's why we start uh, this course with a large memory focus, since that is the major bottleneck in today's systems. And we're going to try to uh, figure out uh, how to solve that bottleneck also. There are many approaches that are being developed right now, as we have talked about in the prior lecture. Okay, these are four key problems and directions in computer architecture that I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, essentially uh, are important to follow and that are being followed in the field today uh, very heavily. And uh, I briefly talked about them. We're going to talk about a lot of them actually within the context of memory based. How do we design fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architectures? These are three different things, but they actually get affected uh, by memory uh, in similar ways. Potentially, if you get a bit flip, for example, in memory, it affects, it compromises your security, it, it makes your system unreliable, and it also compromises your safety in the end. So we're going to talk about this uh, a lot. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about energy efficiency, fundamentally energy efficient architectures, which need to be memory centric. We're going to talk about that uh, quite a bit. And I think this also uh, uh, goes into performance, because if you're energy efficient today, you can, you can parallelize your work a lot more and become higher performance as well. So energy is really very much fundamentally related to your performance because systems are power limited, systems are energy and battery life limited. As you reduce, improve your energy efficiency, you can actually uh, make your system higher performance as well. Uh, okay, and, and the, uh, so we're gonna talk a lot about that within the context of memory as well as not memory later on. And uh, the third one is fundamentally low latency and predictable architecture. So how do we actually reduce the latency as much as possible uh, this is important, as you can imagine. And how do you make things predictable? Uh, one of the big things, actually, these, these uh, all three are actually big challenges uh, that were proposed by Computing Research Association at some point. Uh, once in a while, Computing Research Association, at least in the United States, they basically uh, gather and uh, talk about these are the biggest challenges that we're facing in computing industry today. Uh, and uh, these are all uh, uh, proposed as challenges at some point. And I believe they're they're also, there are still challenges. Technology scaling is another one that we are going to talk about quite a bit. Uh, okay, but uh, I think I'm going to actually start talking about applications to begin with, because remember our, uh, uh, our axiom in this course is we really need to design things from algorithms to devices and think about architecture from this broad perspective so that we can actually get good solutions that are highly efficient high performance, hopefully very secure, very reliable, low latency and predictable. So uh, applications are really what drive uh, innovation and uh, problem solutions in the end. Architectures, of course, uh, they also drive these things. Technology also drives these things, but it's really the entire stack that gets connected to actually solve the problems that we have uh, in society, in medicine, in health, in genomics, in artificial intelligence, for example. That's why I think the last bullet is very important. And that's a very uh, important direction that's being taken today uh, in research as well as in industry. So I'm gonna start with this as a motivator because I believe that that's really an important motivator in systems. So I call this the motivating detour and I'm going to focus especially on genome sequence analysis. We're gonna talk about AI and machine learning. We did talk about that. That's another application that's actually, uh, would, would make a really nice motivating detour. But I think genome sequence analysis is something that's up and coming even further into the future. And AI and ML, there's a lot of work that's happening right now, but uh, genome sequencing, there's less work, but people are realizing the importance of it, especially with this COVID-19 outbreak, as you can imagine. Uh, and I think going forward, we're gonna see a lot more in this direction. And this is also an example of how do you potentially uh, uh, architect an application and architecture together uh, for health, and medical reasons and also scientific advancements. So let's take a look at this motivating detour. And this is something that's close to my heart because uh, we actually have been doing work on this for almost 12 years right now. Actually, uh, it was a dream to begin with. Uh, this is uh, a dream we had in around 2007 on a hike in the beautiful Mount Rainier in uh, the Washington state of the United States. Uh, and we basically wanted to, uh, with, with, my, with my collaborator, John Alcon, who was at University of Washington at that time, we basically dreamt about having an embedded device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time. And we really wanted real time. Within a minute or even less, we wanted to get an answer from a device. And this device would sequence your genome uh, 
and maybe answer questions, sophisticated questions like this. Which of these DNAs does this DNA segment match with from your genome or from somebody else's genome or from a virus's genome, right? Or uh, you could answer a question like, uh, what is the likely genetic disposition of this patient to this drug? Again, uh, from the time you take the sample uh, until the time you get the answer to this question, we want a minute. It's aggressive, right? Today it takes days, actually. I will give you examples uh, from Nanopore later on. It takes hours, but their analyses are very simple to begin with. So if you want to do sophisticated analyses, it, it can take days or weeks, actually, today in today's devices. Uh, and then there may be other questions like this, right? What disease or condition might this particular DNA or RNA piece uh, is associated with, right? Or could it be associated? And this is actually one of the questions that are asked with COVID-19 sequ uh, sequencing right now. And there may be many, many other questions you can imagine. We're going to see some examples of this. And at some point, we're going to have a longer lecture on uh, uh, specialized architectures for genomics uh, in this course. Uh, but basically, this was our dream. Uh, that's, uh, uh, th this dream actually starts uh, a lot of things. And as I mentioned in the previous lecture, listen, always listen to the dreamers. People may have applications in mind or may not have applications in mind, but they dream that something will be better. It's always good to, as an architect, uh, listen to the dreamers and not dismiss them because that dream may become a reality 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, or maybe even earlier, who knows, right? And you would like to be ready uh, or you'd like to enable those dreams as an architect in the end. Okay, so you probably had some bi biology class in high school or even at the university. Uh, you may know of genomes and DNA and RNA actually consist of these bases. And these bases are ACTG. I'm not gonna go through the details of it, but this is basically uh, discovered in 1950s. And uh, it's, it makes up our genetic code in the end. It makes up our predispositions, it makes up our uh, what, what we look like. Uh, it makes up essentially uh, a lot of things uh, that is related to us. And that's not just us. It's really also uh, other uh, living beings uh, on the earth at least. And this is, uh, this is real. This is real stuff. You all have these, uh, hopefully. Uh, and this is an example, actually, uh, uh, chromosome number 12, for example, from Gila. Gila is uh, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she's very famous in this field because uh, her, her genomes were taken from her without her consent, and they enabled a lot of research in this area, enabled a lot of understanding of DNA for us, uh, of course, at the cost potentially of her privacy, right? So there are a lot of interesting issues, actually, in genome analysis and DNA, uh, like privacy, security, safety of data. Uh, how do you ensure that the information that is sequenced in the end doesn't get exposed to the outside so that someone else doesn't that, use that information against you? in whatever context. So these are really, really interesting issues. Uh, no question about that. And there's work in this area uh, that's happening, uh, but we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about even uh, basically the fundamentals. How do we actually get uh, this DNA to be sequenced very fast and efficiently? Okay, so what is uh, genome sequencing? Basically the goal in genome sequencing is to find the complete sequence of these bases or base pairs in DNA or RNA. RNA is interesting, especially today with the viruses, right? But let's, DNA is more complex and uh, we'll focus on DNA, but whatever we discuss is also applicable to RNA. Uh, of course, you may need to specialize even more for RNA sometimes. Okay, so the challenge is this basically. Today, we do not have a machine that takes a long DNA as input and gives a complete sequence as output. For example, the human DNA is 3.2 billion base pairs long. And there's no machine that basically takes your DNA nicely and gives you the entire sequence. Here is your 3.2 billion base pairs and do whatever you want with it. And uh, unfortunately, all machines provide a trade-off, meaning uh, they chop the DNA into pieces because that's, uh, that's the nature of things. We have not figured out the technology that gives us the entire DNA as input. If you figure out that technology, actually you can uh, be rich or you can actually have a huge impact uh, on human lives going forward. Actually, you can do both probably if you're, if you're smart. Uh, but basically, all sequencing machines today chop DNA into pieces, long or short, and they identify these relatively small pieces, but they do not tell you how, they fit to, uh, how these pieces fit together in the end. So it's essentially a puzzle you're left with after uh, you chop your DNA into pieces through, some of these sequence, through all of these sequencing machines. And the puzzle is, where do these fit, uh, pieces fit together? Uh, and in the end, you want to reconstruct uh, your entire DNA, or at least a good chunk of your DNA such that you can ask questions to it. 
because uh, some machines actually give you pieces that are of 300 base pairs long. Remember, a human DNA is 3.2 billion base pairs long. So with 300, you cannot do much. You should at least cover uh, a good chunk of your DNA so that you can answer questions about it. Okay, so let me pictorially show this. You have a large DNA molecule. It doesn't look nicely like this. I will show you. It's, 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 it, it, it's really like a yarn ball, actually, as we will see in the next picture, uh, or one of the next pictures. The machine chops the DNA into small DNA fragments. These are called reads. And these reads need to be mapped uh, somehow so that you can make sense out of them. So this is actually similar to untangling yarn balls. Your DNA actually looks like this. It doesn't, uh, it's not straight. It's actually uh, 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 curled up like this in your uh, cells. Uh, and there may, it may be also mixed with other DNA somehow. Uh, if you have viruses and bacteria, for example, uh, when you take a sample, there may be lots of mixes of DNAs you get from different species. So it's, it's, the picture really looks messy like this. I mean, this may not be as messy as it could be, but it's, it's messy in the end. Whenever you uh, feed something into a chopping machine, uh, you don't have a straight DNA. And the chopping machine, has, uh, chopping machines are actually really, really interesting because uh, they, uh, what, what they do is they, uh, uh, what, what they do is they, uh, they use different techniques to actually figure out what are the bases. For example, some of the chopping machines uh, shine light on the DNA. So they're, uh, one of the companies is called Illumina, basically. It's called Illumina because uh, they, uh, they basically shine light on the DNA. This is a very high level description. And based on the reaction that they get with different bases uh, on the light, uh, uh, they get different refractions, for example. Uh, uh, and uh, they have a customized circuit to actually uh, get those reactions. And they can record the different bases of the DNA based on those, that reaction. That's one machine. Another machine, nanopore sequencing, operates in a completely different way. Basically, it uh, passes the DNA through a nanoscale hole, very small, as you can imagine. And while the DNA passes this nanoscale hole, uh, what happens is uh, different bases cause different perturbations. So it can measure the current uh, through this nanoscale hole, and different bases lead to different currents. As a result, you can guess, oh, okay, this is an A, this is a T, this is a C, this is a G. Uh, that's how you guess, basically. So the technology is very different, but these technologies are not perfect. As a result, you get errors in the technology. And also, these technologies, for them to work, you need to chop the DNA into either small pieces, like 300 base pairs in the case of Illumina, or large pieces, like maybe 100,000 if you're lucky, or a million if you're really lucky in nanopore sequencing. Uh, and as a result, still much smaller than 3.2 billion base pairs. And the error rates vary also. So basically, that's the job of the machine today. And the machines, people have actually worked on these machines a lot. Some of these are really expensive, like this one. Uh, I, I, I actually, this one actually is the latest one, I think, on this picture at least. Uh, it's, it could be more than a million dollars, I think $3 million, some of them. Uh, and they're very accurate, but they give you short reads, basically 300 base pairs long or so. So your computational puzzle is much more difficult because now you're trying to figure out where does this 300 base pair read come from in the 3.2 billion base pair human genome? Not so easy. Okay. Uh, some of the other machines like this, uh, this thing that fits in your palm, uh, Oxford Nanopore, the Minion, is much smaller as you can see. Its form factor is smaller. It's also much cheaper. It's about $1,000 or so, which means that you can buy it and the cost is very nice. And the, the upside is it gives you long reads, like as I said, 100,000 or 1 million base pairs, which is still shorter than 3.2 billion base pairs, but still much longer than 300. So a computational problem is less bad. But unfortunately, the technology, because this device is built on some technology that's not uh, as, uh, that more error prone, the error rate that you get in the sequencing is much higher. It's like 10, 10 to 15%, meaning that uh, whatever you sequenced is wrong by 10 to 15 percent, which means that you need to do even more computational analysis to compensate for it, which, means, uh, which, which is usually done in the form of sequencing more. So if you sequence my DNA once, that's not enough because there's a lot of error. So sequence it, let's say, 300 times or 1,000 times so that hopefully you do computational analyses uh, uh, that tell you uh, that get rid of the errors with some confidence. That's the idea, basically. Of course, I'm not going into a lot of detail, but that's the basic high level idea uh, as to how we can tolerate errors in these devices. But these devices are real, as I will show you, these are actually being used in uh, COVID-19 sequencing and a lot of them are being used today. I, I think I've already shown you one slide, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, in the future. Uh, okay, 
So basically, uh, the key takeaway is there are many genome sequencers and all produce data with different properties. And uh, data is, in the end, reads, chopped, uh, chopped parts of your DNA or RNA. And now there needs to be some computational analysis that needs to be done to actually make sense out of this DNA and to answer questions related to it. Okay. Okay, so basically this all, uh, let me give you some historical perspective and why this is actually really getting interesting today. And then we'll talk about some uh, ideas on building an accelerator for it. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail in this particular lecture. This is really motivation for memory in the end. Basically, we're gonna, uh, let, me, let me foreshadow. We're gonna basically say all of this is really bottlenecked by how fast we can store, process, and operate on data. So memory is a huge bottleneck in these devices as it was in artificial intelligence and machine learning accelerator devices. But let's start with the historical context. Uh, the historical context is important because a lot of investment was done uh, on the human genome project and human genome project really enabled uh, a lot of what we are doing uh, today. This was a 13 year long project. It was supported by a lot of government agencies in the United States. And uh, if you normalize it to today's dollars, it's only $3 billion. I say only because this is such an important thing that I think $3 billion is really nothing to spend on something like uh, the science. It may sound large, but it's really not large in the grand, grand scheme of things, right? Today, I, I don't want to talk about it as much, but people are spending billions and billions, actually trillions of dollars on things that are much more destructive than uh, to what happens to Earth. Why not spend $3 billion to actually really understand something that's really important. Of course, as I mentioned in our, in our previous uh, lectures, technology is agnostic uh, to ethics, right? Whatever you do after this $3 million could be good or bad. And actually there, there, uh, uh, there are really interesting research that's going on today on genome editing, for example, right? Genome editing uh, can actually change what your genome looks like uh, because we have understood what your genome looks like after investing $3 billion plus dollars uh, on it. And that genome editing is some technology that's, that could be used for good or bad, right, in the end. Uh, you could actually uh, use it to treat diseases. You could actually use it to actually do whatever that's bad. You can imagine many things that are bad. We don't need to talk about that. But basically, my point is this investment enabled a lot of really good understanding. Uh, if, if this investment was not done into science at that point in time, uh, we would have been in a much worse situation today in COVID-19, for example, or something uh, else, right? Basically, we wouldn't be understanding as much. Okay, so this is interesting because while this was going on uh, in 2000 or so, uh, genome sequencing was really expensive. These devices were expensive. This is the cost per row megabase of DNA uh, sequence. How much really you, you need to pay for one, one million bases to get them sequenced. It was a lot. I'm gonna normalize it to human genome in one of the later figures, actually. It was a lot at that time. And over time, people developed these high throughput sequencing technologies. Illumina is one that I talked about. It became very high throughput, so the cost stopped, started dropping a lot. And over time, later, Nanopore was introduced, which actually reduced the cost even more. So you can see the importance of technology uh, on something like genome sequencing here. Initially, the technology was not good enough, so it was very costly. Over time, there was a breakthrough, which is high throughput sequencing technologies, so cost became reduced a lot. And there was another breakthrough with Nanopore, I would say. Uh, there's also PacBio, actually, but Nanopore gets a lot of attention because of its devices. Uh, but basically, long read technologies, I should say. This is short read technologies that are high throughput. This is long read technologies that are also high throughput. And that second breakthrough actually got us to very small costs, like $1,000 or so for the entire human genome. And you can see this is Moore's law depicted uh, to compare. So Moore's, we're basically reducing the cost of genome analysis today much faster than the cost of a transistor is reducing. Okay, keep that in mind. As a result, there is a lot of work on sequencing genomes and understanding genomes. Uh, a lot of countries have actually their own genome projects. Uh, and this, I think this slide is actually even out of date right now. We have lots of genome sequence. So basically we can produce much more genomic data than we can process today. It's, it's very easy uh, to produce the data. And we have a huge computational bottleneck. Okay, so this is, that previous slide uh, zoomed in a little bit more, but uh, and again, this is cost per raw megabase. If you translate it to cost per human genome, in 2001, uh, the cost for sequencing a human genome was about $100 million. With uh, uh, short read sequencing, high throughput sequencing, it reduced dramatically, as you can see. And with nanopore sequencing, it reduced another order of magnitude, uh, as you can see over here. And it's, it keeps reducing basically over time. 
we're in 2020 and we're close to a thousand dollars today which is really nice and you can do it in a form factor that's really uh, nice uh, with the with the form factor that i showed you with nanopore okay so basically i think my point is because of uh, beautiful investments that are made in science and technology the sequencing is not a huge bottleneck today we can always do better of course uh, uh, in sequencing but we're actually reaching uh, it's become very difficult to actually do better we need another breakthrough for example in sequencing and that's a very fascinating area also again if you're interested uh, you can learn more about it it's beyond what we will cover in this course there's a computational part of it but there's also a very much physical uh, and electronic uh, low-level device part of it also if you're interested in that part i would uh, recommend you read about sequencing technologies but we're going to assume that these sequencing technologies exist as they do and they produce data at very high bandwidth and reasonably low latency. It could be much better, of course. Uh, but basically, what, is, what comes afterwards, a computational analysis, uh, which is read mapping I'm gonna talk about briefly. And then once you meet, read, uh, map the reads to a reference genome and understand how they fit together, now we can call variants, basically. We can compare these reads, compare the genome to other genomes uh, or ask the questions like what we were asking. Is this gene, is this gene vulnerable to some sort of, uh, signify vulnerable to some sort of disease? And then that could enable medical advancements, uh, medical uh, prescriptions like this, or scientific discovery. So we're really bottlenecked by uh, this step over here. So let me actually motivate a little bit more. There are other questions actually that you can ask. And that actually makes the comp uh, computational analysis even worse. So this is multiple sequ sequence al alignment, for example. Uh, let me move this over, okay. Uh, basically, in this case, you have a bunch of different sequences, and you basically are trying to compare all possible parts of them. And the question is, in what parts they are same, in what parts they are different. So you can imagine this is not an easy task, actually, if you have billions of genomes, and if each, each genome is made out of, let's say, not even billions of base pairs, but millions of base pairs. This is a huge matrix, and you want to do this comparison. And this is not computationally easy. And the comparison is not just an equality comparison. It's, as we will discuss later, it's really an approximate string matching problem. You're really approximately comparing these things because uh, you're almost never interested in an exact match. Exact matches are not that interesting because there are errors in uh, evolution, there are errors in DNA, there are errors in the machine, uh, and there are variants between uh, there these different genomes. You're almost always interested in uh, a match within some error meaning some base pairs may be different. And then you do further analysis on it. Because same matches, exact matches usually don't exist. And when they exist, they may be interesting, but most of the time they're not so interesting actually. So what is really, really interesting is what's called these variants or differences between these different pieces. You really want to understand those variants. And to get those variants actually, what happens is, uh, it's, it's, a, if it's an even tougher computational problem to actually do approximate string matching compared to exact string matching, right? Exact string matching is uh, relatively easy, as we have uh, discussed. You basically compare every single point, uh, every single uh, character uh, in one string to the corresponding character in another string. And if they don't match, it's easy to find out. If they do match, it's easy to find out. But where do they match and how much do they match is a much harder problem, uh, as we will see in a little bit. Uh, in, a, in an example where I'm going to compare the string Netherlands to Switzerland, for example. Okay, so this is another example that I think is beautifully drawn uh, uh, that shows uh, the complexity of the problem. And you can imagine what, what goes into it algorithmically also. Okay, so as, you, as I mentioned, uh, humans are not uh, similar to each other. Maybe I should update this picture on the left over here, but uh, uh, hopefully we will not have to use this sort of picture uh, soon, but who knows? Uh, it's uh, the reasonableness of human beings is uh, really uh, put up the question these days. But basically, uh, even though uh, you may not think everybody is human, uh, people are human and they're similar to a large extent, but they're not exactly similar as you can see. Humans are similar to each other. There are some differences. And humans and chimpanzees, they're also similar, but a little bit less similar uh, to uh, what humans are similar to each other. And you can see that humans are similar to bananas, 50 to 60% also, right? That's why I say, the same portions are really not really that interesting. Uh, although there might be some insight you can gain, the, uh, the diseases and vulnerabilities and really the biggest understanding actually comes from these variations. Okay, so another question over here, for example, given a bunch of short sequences uh, that you have uh, from sequencing a human genome, can you identify the approximate species 
uh, cluster for genetic, genomically unknown uh, organisms. So you've actually uh, stumbled upon something. You have no idea what it is. Can you identify what it is? COVID-19 could be an, an example of this, right? Uh, there are, of course, really interesting questions about COVID-19. Can it be discovered earlier? Uh, so maybe if these analyses were done uh, preventively, you could discover uh, dangerous things earlier, right? Uh, and of course, these analyses are even harder uh, because these are usually graph-based analyses and the Bruin graphs are one example of graphs that are used to represent uh, these small sequences uh, in relation to uh, other small sequences, as you can see over here. Now you need to actually do a graph-based comparison uh, on these short sequences to really understand uh, what is the similarity and what is the approximate cluster, species cluster, this genomically unknown organism uh, belongs to. Uh, and this is very interesting, I think. Uh, and there are a lot of graph algorithms associated with it. We're going to talk about graph processing later on. Graph processing is something that's really used in many, many domains, graph analytics. And genomics is one domain that's, uh, I think, going to use graph analytics even more uh, going into the future. This is also called message genomics, actually, uh, as we will discuss uh, in a later lecture. Okay, so these are some examples. Basically, if you want to actually have answers to all of these questions, you're not bottlenecked by the sequencer itself, but you're really bottlenecked by the computational analysis that you need to do. And the first step of that computational analysis is read mapping. Basically, you need to do some sort of read mapping. And this is just one example over here. I don't want to go into the details, but basically, the th uh, this basically shows that the throughput of a sequencing machine is much higher than the throughput of how fast you can, we can process uh, the output of that machine today. And this is becoming worse and worse going into the future. If your analyses are even more sophisticated, for example, if you want to uh, find approximate string matching with even higher error rates, like 10 to 15%, which could lead to even, high, even more interesting discoveries potentially downstream, uh, this uh, throughput of that analysis is even lower today. Okay. So basically the problem is uh, we have many reads after sequencing and we need to reconstruct the entire genome. How do we do that? Okay, basically uh, we're back to the same picture. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. These are the reads. You chop the genome into small fragments and you got the reads. How do you reconstruct the genome? And let me actually briefly talk about two different types of analyses that you do. These are the reads that you have. I'm going to talk about what's called read mapping. It's a method of aligning the reads to a known reference genome to detect matches and variations. So you can take these reads, you may have a known reference genome and you try to align uh, the reads to them. Uh, this is nice, it's easier because you already have something known. For example, I have my genome sequenced. Uh, 10 years ago, somebody else's genome was sequenced as a human genome. Actually human genome, uh, it represents multiple different humans genomes that are sequenced right now. But now we, know, we have a reference genome for humans. Uh, once my genome is sequenced, uh, I, can, I can get it compared to, uh, I can get the reads uh, from my sequence compared to this human reference genome. And that's a an relatively easier process called read mapping, but it's still computationally expensive as we will see. There's also another process called de novo assembly, which is you don't even have a mess, uh, reference genome. Basically you just have the reads, you don't have a reference genome, and you try to merge the reads in some way to construct the original sequence. It's a much harder problem, and sophisticated graph processing algorithms are employed here, and the accuracy is not as high as read mapping, uh, as uh, well, we will not see it in this lecture, but as we will see later. Uh, so both of these are actually valid approaches. So of course, if you have a reference genome to compare to, it's always good to do read mapping to begin with, and then you can actually refine what you've done uh, to get a fully assembled genome. Okay, let me pictorially demonstrate this. Basically, these are the reads, my reads that are sequenced, and uh, some computational analysis is going to map them to the reference genome as much as possible with some errors allowed. Okay, basically this, there's some sort of mapping that happens, as we will see later on also. Uh, whereas the no assembly, you don't have the reference genome, you basically somehow magically reconstruct the original sequence. So how is that magic done? I'm not gonna go into the detail. As I said, it's a very computationally heavy process and it's not easy to do it. So accuracy is not as high today. So usually what people do is a combination of both. You have the Nova assembly, okay, that gives you something, and then you do read mapping and then you iterate somehow. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, this may not be perfect if you really truly have a genomically unknown organism, right? So computational analyses that you do over here is actually very, very sophisticated as you can imagine. And they're really so exciting papers that you can read about them. Okay, let's focus on read mapping. I'm gonna focus on even the easier problem because the easier problem is actually something that is done today 
That's what's done by the sequence. Uh, everybody does it. The Nova assembly is actually, al even algorithms are a little bit less mature uh, in this area. Whereas in read mapping, I think, even though we're still developing algorithms, algorithms are more or less mature compared to the Nova assembly. So we can actually tackle the read mapping problem to build a device much better, better today. Okay, so basically the read mapping is defined as mapping many short DNA fragments, reads, to a known reference genome with some differences a lot. DNA logically looks like this. It's a double, uh, double helix, as you can see, uh, uh, a double-sided strand. Uh, and physically, it looks like this. You have a chopping machine that goes through it, chops it into reads, and reads are mapped to the reference genome with some differences allowed through the read mapping process. That's the idea. Again, it's not a perfect mapping. It's an approximate mapping because you really want to find those differences, which means that a particular read over here can map to multiple places also, potentially, because there may be multiple places in the reference genome that are similar to that read, approximately. Okay, so keep that in mind. So, but we're, as in the end, we're tr really trying to reconstruct the genome that we have using the reference genome as a reference. Okay, so uh, in the end, mapping short reads to a reference genome is challenging. In the case of humans, you have billions of 50 to 300 base pair reads in the reference genome. So it's not easy. So what is uh, done today? Basically today, what happens is you use what's called read alignment and verification. Whenever you have a 300 base pair read, for example, uh, if you're not uh, smart, if you don't have a smart algorithm, uh, and this was the case in 1990s and early 2000s, for example, uh, what you would do is you would take every single 300 base pair and compare to every possible 300 base pair location in the reference genome. And you can imagine this is really, really heavy because you have 3.2 billion base pairs divided by 300 uh, locations to compare to. And again, this comparison, each comparison is called a read alignment or verification. It's also called edit distance computation. Basically, we're gonna, let's be a little bit formal and define this edit distance a little bit more. Uh, edit distance is defined as the minimum number of edits that are required to make the read exactly match the reference segment. So we want to do an approximate comparison. Uh, so we allow some number of edits. What are these edits that are, that could be insertions compared to the reference, deletions from the reference or substitutions into the reference. So basically you can allow these different edits and you're trying to find out uh, uh, the minimum number of edits uh, to uh, enable uh, to, to, uh, that, that should be done to the reference genome such that the read exactly matches the reference segment. So let's take an example of this. Let's assume your reference genome segment is Switzerland and your read from your genome is Netherlands. Uh, since you're, you may be from Netherlands, your read actually outputs Netherlands, right? And now you're gonna compare uh, Netherlands to Switzerland, uh, which is the reference in this case. And you want to find out what is the minimum number of edits uh, that you need to make to Netherlands to uh, make it exactly match the reference segment. Okay, so let's take a look at it over here. There are four different types of edits that can happen to Netherlands to match Switzerland. Well, it could be an exact match. In this, in this case, there's no edit, clearly. Uh, it could be a deletion. For example, this I over here in Switzerland is deleted in Netherlands. You can see that, right? It could be an insertion, for example, uh, this, uh, at the end of Switzerland, you need to insert an S to actually uh, make it uh, uh, the same as Netherlands, okay? Uh, you, could, you could see either one as reference. Uh, I think I'm, I, uh, I, I'll use that uh, interchangeably. Or it could be a mismatch. For example, uh, Switzerland has SW in the first two characters, and uh, they're essentially declared mismatches uh, to make the two strings e equal, right? Exactly match. That's the idea over here. So if you look at this over here, basically, if you want to make uh, Netherlands exactly match Switzerland or vice versa, there needs to be three mismatches that you declare, one deletion from Switzerland and one insertion into the Switzerland. So basically you need to do as a, at a minimum, one, two, three, four, five edits to make Netherlands exactly match Switzerland. That's the idea. And uh, you, can, you can look at uh, the original length of the reference, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11, right? So basically in this case, we have a reference of length 11 and we need to make five edits to it to make a read exactly match it. So it's about a fifth, uh, almost a 50% error rate, 45%, 45.45 repeated 
error rate, right, as you can see. So that's a very high error rate. But there is a big similarity between Switzerland and Netherlands, as you can see over here. OK, so the question is, how do you do this computationally, right? So this, it turns out this is computationally not so easy. What people do is they use dynamic programming algorithms because you want to find the minimum number of edits. So it requires uh, uh, creating a matrix and then uh, figuring out what is the minimum number of traversals that you need to do through those matrix. I'm not going to talk about that at this point, but it's, but it's a dynamic programming pro problem algorithmically. And if you know something about dynamic programming, you would immediately know that this is very complicated. Uh, it's, it's, it's quadratic in terms of its, uh, mm, uh, its, its scaling, big O notation. And uh, as a result, this takes a lot of time, even with a small string that looks like this. Now imagine doing this for 300 base pairs with let's say 10% difference a lot. Okay, so computationally, it's expensive. Okay, so uh, let me go into the high level picture. In read mapping, uh, you, you need to basically do these comparisons. This is edit distance uh, computation. And if you do it all over the place, this becomes intractable. It takes a lot of time. And if we will discuss that, uh, I will show you some results. Uh, and there are reasons why you may want to do it all over the place. You need to find many mappings of each read. Basically, you, how can you find all mappings efficiently? To be able to do that, you need to compare the read to all parts of the reference genome. Again, if your read is 300 base pairs, you need to compare it to all possible 300 base pair locations in a 3.2 billion base pair reference genome. Does not sound good. You need to do the computation that I mentioned earlier, edit distance computation for all those locations. That's one. The second is you need to tolerate small variance and errors in each read, as I said. Uh, there are multiple reasons for it. One is the machines are not perfect, so you get some erroneous reads, uh, erroneous base pairs in each read. Second, each individual different subject's DNA may slightly differ from the reference, and we really want to detect that uh, because those are the actually cases that indicate some problem potentially or some difference or some genetic variation that you're really interested in for scientific purposes. Then the question becomes, how can we efficiently map each read uh, to different parts of a, a reference genome with up to E errors present. So that's the edit distance computation with E edits at most. And there's the, the trend today is we want to increase E as much as possible so that we don't miss anything. Basically, I think scientific progress uh, uh, is at a point where it depends on E being large. Of course, if it's too large, then it doesn't make sense, right? Then you have complete different uh, genomes. But if E is around 5%, that's a good uh, starting point. If E is around 10%, that may be even better. Okay, so I, I think I, somebody has raised their hand. Is there a question? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, yes, please uh, go ahead. So, um, the, like finding up to E errors is also a problem, but the finding the, like, the operations the necessary to do the edits, isn't that also a problem? Uh, so yes, basically, uh, you mean you mean the mismatches, insertions, and deletions, right? Yeah, identifying the the operations uh, in the first place. Yeah, exactly. That's all. That's also a problem. Basically, that that actually is something that I don't want to go into right now. But oh, okay. uh, yeah, exactly. Some of these are more important scientifically or genomically. For example, a deletion signifies something more important uh, genomically. So understanding uh, th those is really important. So absolutely, that's true. So these operations are, uh, don't necessarily have the same meaning, for example, depending on what you're looking into in the downstream analyses, a deletion must be, may be much more important, which means that when you're doing this read mapping, there's another function, which is also called a scoring function, for example. I don't necessarily like the name of it, but prioritization function, let's say, that tells you some of these operations are even more important for the downstream genomic analyses. So I want things uh, that uh, maximize the scoring function that uh, I provide to you whenever you do this mapping. And that complicates things to an even more, uh, even more uh, higher computational extent. So that's a very, very good point. So it's not just number of errors, but it's the type of errors uh, that really matter. So you can imagine that complicates things even more. That's a very good point, thanks. Uh, and also on top of this, we need to map each read very fast. So performance and efficiency are very important. As I mentioned multiple times, human DNA is very long. Uh, so at least to millions of, uh, to billions of reads, and state-of-the-art mappers take weeks to map a human DNA. Of course, it's a function of E, this is a function of the scoring function that we just discussed. Uh, then the key question becomes, how can we design a much higher performance read mapper? So hopefully I motivated the problem uh, to you. This is really interesting computational problem. 
uh, and if you code, if you want to co-design the machines and the computation together, it becomes even more interesting. So when we asked the question in 2007, can we actually design machines uh, that can do this comprehensively and very fast within a minute? Uh, and we want all types of analysis within a minute, just not just the read mapping. Read mapping is the first step really uh, for the analysis. We want to all types of analysis within a minute. Uh, so it's, it's actually a really uh, aggressive goal target we set for ourselves. Uh, the first thing we did actually was uh, not to go and accelerate stuff because we found out that the read mappers at that time were not actually good enough to begin with. So we actually designed a read mapper uh, with John Alcon, who I mentioned as a collaborator we dreamt with. Uh, basically, uh, we designed the read mapper that is guaranteed to find all mappings of every given read. So it's very sensitive because we believe that this was really important for downstream science. We don't want to lose sensitivity. Basically, at the time, people were looking at exact matches. Uh, of course, there was research showing that variants are really important, but a lot of the uh, uh, industrial tools, let's say, were really happy with looking at exact matches. There was a tool called BLAST, for example. It's a nice name. It actually has a lot of use, but it was really limited to exact matches at the time. We said, no, exact matches are not really what we're interested in. We really want to be very sensitive to errors, and we want a mapper that's designed fundamentally to tolerate up to E errors, where uh, E is, uh, could be a large configurable number. And this is the mapper. I'm not going to bore you with it. You can actually download it and play with it. Uh, there are actually or later versions that I'm going to discuss very briefly uh, that does this. And we're going to talk about this in a computational, uh, computational uh, basically uh, exciting genome analysis lecture. But uh, if you're interested, you can take a look at it. Uh, OK, but if you design such a mapper, even that mapper spends most of its time on read alignment. It takes a long time. In fact, our mapper is actually slow, I was slower at the time compared to existing mappers because we were comprehensive. We wanted to tolerate, for example, uh, up to E errors. And if E is 5%, our mapper ran like a dog, <laughs> very slowly, basically. It was slow because we wanted to be sensitive and it makes sense uh, to be slow. And our mapper and other mappers were spending almost all of their time on read alignment, basically. And then we asked the question, is this a good idea? Basically, we essentially were bottlenecked by this read mapping. And then we wanted to focus on read mapping to make it much faster so that we could at least take baby steps to achieve our goal. And the first idea, and actually this was an idea that proved to be really important to examine for more than a decade in the end, because there are many, many variations of the idea in the end, uh, was why do we need to do these edit distance comparisons uh, to everything, on everything? So why don't we design a very quick filter that can quickly tell us whether we need to do a heavyweight edit distance computation uh, for, this uh, for this particular read in this particular uh, genome uh, location or DNA location. Basically, uh, we want to quickly design a filter. It could be a bloom filter, as we've discussed bloom filters, but it doesn't have to be a bloom filter. As we will see, it, uh, it, it could be utilize a bloom filter, actually, but not necessarily. This, uh, this filter quickly tells us, do the edit distance comparison because there might be a match, or it tells us, don't bother, that's not going to match with the uh, error rates that you're looking at. That's the idea. So we want to minimize these really costly approximate string comparisons, which lead to dynamic programming algorithms. That's the idea over here. And this is a very good idea, I think. It leads to a two-level mapper in the end. The first level is a filter. It's called a pre-alignment filter uh, right now, but uh, you can think of it as a filter. Uh, and the second level is really uh, to really do the approximate string matching comparisons or edit distance computations on things that the filter tells you you should focus on. If the filter tells you don't focus on, then you're done. And hopefully your filter is accurate, meaning that it doesn't have false negatives. Uh, meaning that if uh, uh, it only filters out uh, locations that are not going to match. If there's a possibility that a location is potentially going to match the read with the errors allowed, it doesn't, it's not going to filter it out. So in this case, uh, remember the false negatives, it doesn't have false negatives, hopefully, but it can have false positives. Basically, even though later downstream, this read is not going to match the uh, location uh, in the reference genome, maybe the filter is not perfectly accurate. It says, oh, okay, still do the edit distance computation. You will do a little bit more computation, sure, but at least you will not miss uh, a potential match. So this is really important. And that's where the design of the filter becomes extremely important. And that's why there's a huge, uh, very nice trade-off space to analyze. 
and again, this is, you can do algorithms, you can design algorithms for it and you can design architectures for it. Even better, you can design algorithms, uh, uh, architectures and devices together. Okay, so let's explore this idea a little bit. In the, in the beginning, when we actually had, first had this idea, we started with a pure software approach. We said, you could do this filtering in software. You could actually understand the relationships between different parts of a reference genome. And if you understand those relationships, and if you also understand some relationships between reads, what you can do is you can eliminate uh, the reads. Uh, you can eliminate some uh, lo locations in the reference genome uh, from consideration because you have understood the reference genome uh, better because you, you have some metadata related to the reference genome and you stored it in a nice way in a hash table, let's say. And if you know that a read has matched, you know that some other going, read is not going to match. Uh, it, it, basically, if you know that uh, a previous read is, is, has not matched, you know that the next read is not going to match also because of some relationship that you have in terms of the locations of uh, the potential reads in the reference genome. So that's one idea. Uh, Okay, I'm not going to go into the ideas, but basically if you uh, use the ideas software, pure software based ideas in this uh, paper, you get a, about a 20x speed up, which is not bad actually to begin with. So these are now algorithms, software algorithms uh, you devise. Okay, 20x, not enough actually. If your analysis took, I don't know, two weeks, 20x reduces by only 20. If it took two months, only 20 is not good. We want one minute or less than one minute. So after that, we actually decided maybe you should really utilize underlying features of the hardware, which is SIMD acceleration. A lot of processors have uh, SSE extensions, MMX extensions. Right now it's called AVX. I don't know what it's called right now actually, but I think it's AVX. Advanced vector extensions, for example, when Intel first introduced them, it was MMX. We will cover them actually in the SIMD lectures later on, but multimedia extensions initially. Now it's advanced vector extensions. So basically, can you design algorithms to do this filtering such that that algorithm really nicely maps to this bitwise operations that you can do very fast in general purpose processing architectures using these advanced vector extensions. And the, yes, and the, question, and the answer is yes, once you start thinking that way, you devise an algorithm that's really nice. It's called the shifting timing distance. I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but it's a nice cute algorithm that actually uh, does bitwise operations to actually do this filtering. And it turns out this can speed up your read mapping by about, 3x or so. Okay, after that, we figured out that, oh, this actually fits nicely with FPGAs also. Uh, so we actually designed the first FPGA based alignment filter. You can map this algorithm that is called shifted timing distance with modifications, of course. So I said it, it does fit the FPGAs in a nice way. And uh, that, this was the first FPGA based pre alignment filter. And it leads to another 10x speed up, basically. Now, yeah, see, you can see that the speed ups are now nicely compounding. And uh, later, Mohammed, who is one of the TAs in this course, you can talk to him about this research. Uh, he's going to present later on, actually. Uh, you can actually uh, devise an accelerator that is even more accurate uh, and uh, more powerful. You can talk to him about this magnet. Uh, but he has some works, actually. Uh, our newest work is actually even better and more efficient pre-alignment filter uh, that gives you another order of magnitude speed up. Actually, this is not the latest work. This slide is a bit old. There's also one unpublished work called Sneaky Snake that gives you even better speed up uh, than this one. But all of these are examples of how do you design uh, uh, algorithms smartly uh, and co-design them together with architectures together such that you get much higher speed ups in the read mapping overall. That's the idea. Okay, so I'm not uh, going to go into the details of this, but basically uh, if you look at read mapping and filtering, in the end, the problem is heavily bottlenecked by data movement. So if you look at gatekeeper, FPGA performance is limited by DRAM bandwidth. That's true for uh, shifted timing distance on the SIMD extensions that I briefly mentioned. So uh, the, uh, a good solution going forward is processing in memory. Processing, basically you don't move the data into a processing engine or an accelerator like, like FPGA. Why don't you do the processing where the data resides? And you encode your data nicely such that your processing is efficient. That's the idea over here. And there's a lot more potential in this uh, area, in my opinion, in addition to other accelerators that we're, uh, we've been looking at. However, of course, you need to design the mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. But this is really not new. Whenever you want to accelerate stuff, uh, you really need to design your algorithms to, uh, so that you can fit your accelerator. So this is one example we're going to talk about later. Uh, this is in-memory uh, DNA sequence analysis, uh, pre-alignment filtering, and you can take a look at this. It's, it represents the human genome or any genome actually, in a way such that it maps nicely to processing in memory architectures. And you could add very small logic 
uh, to uh, processors that are really close to DRAM, such that you can do the specialized processing. OK, so let me uh, wrap up some of the key principles and results. I'm going to talk a little bit more before we delve into the other part of the lecture. But basically, there are two key principles we're exploiting. We're exploiting the structures, uh, structure of the genome to minimize computation at the software level. And we want to morph and exploit the structure of the underlying hardware to maximize performance and efficiency. And this is really algorithm architecture and, if you stretch it a little bit, device co-design for DNA read mapping or genome uh, analysis, let's say. Uh, it, on average, it speeds up read mapping by uh, multiple orders of magnitude, sometimes more. This depends on the data set. Uh, actually, I think it's, uh, this, uh, this 300x is even more with uh, our latest works. And also improves accuracy of read mapping in the presence of errors because you do algorithmic modifications also. Basically, you're improving algorithms and architectures at the same time uh, so that you can get better performance, better efficiency, and even better accuracy at the same time. Let me talk a little bit more, basically. I'm going to motivate you even more because I think this is really an up and coming application. So as I mentioned, uh, there are devices that look like this. This is nanopore devices. Uh, and nanopore devices actually are very promising because of their form factor, as you can see. I'm gonna show you another picture in a little bit that fits into your cell phone. Uh, but basically these devices are cheap. Uh, you can do uh, human genome sequencing in around a thousand bucks, let's say. Uh, they have no computational power, so you just do sequencing. The data that comes out of it needs to be input somewhere else, to your laptop, to the cloud, wherever, to do the analysis. So the analysis is the bottleneck in the end. Of course, in analysis could be anything, right? It's, it could be very, very sophisticated. Uh, but basically, this is, this is very interesting because these produce long reads, one million or so base pair, let's say, long, uh, uh, which is nice because that makes the computational read mapping analysis uh, better. But it has 10 to 15% error rates, as we discussed. So the tools for genome assembly, as we've uh, discussed in this paper, which you may be interested in reading, is really measuring up to the capability of these devices today. One of the reasons is the devices don't have computational power inside them. So if you actually co-design the device and the computational uh, analysis engine with the device, a programmable computational analysis engine, because you want to uh, fit your computational analysis, uh, change your computational analysis, uh, in the device, then you could actually gain a lot more. So future is actually even brighter. So this device was not there actually when we were imagining in 2007, by the way. Uh, this was introduced in 2014. I think this was introduced even later. But you can see that uh, this can fit your cell phone and you can actually download the data and do your analysis on your cell phone. Uh, usually your cell phone is not good enough to do this analysis efficiently you know, at high performance. So you usually ship it somewhere else, unfortunately. But if you could do the analysis by yourself in a device, not necessarily your cell phone, it could be this device itself, then what you could do is actually, you could actually uh, save your privacy as well. You don't give your genomic data to someone else. Uh, and also you could do your analysis uh, fast, hopefully. Right? That's the goal basically. And this analysis is actually really interesting. So Nanopore, for example, you get raw signal data. And first you need to call the basis, meaning that you need to identify the basis are ACTG. That turns out to be not an easy problem. So there are actually a lot of machine learning algorithms that are deployed over here, deep neural networks, for example, that are trained to call the basis. Uh, and then you feed the raw signal data coming out of the nanoscale hole uh, as current readings. You feed it to this neural network and the neural network uh, tells you, okay, this is an A, this is a C, this is a T, this is a G. So you can see that this part of the uh, step uh, to get the DNA reads is bottleneck by some machine learning algorithms, which is really interesting because you could use machine learning accelerators over there, for example. And then the next step is some overlap finding, which I'm not going to talk about, but uh, to be able to do uh, assembly, uh, to be able to understand how these reads map uh, fit together uh, in, in the long genome, you want to find overlaps between them. And it turns out people use, again, graph-based algorithms uh, to do this. Minimap and graph map, they use graph-based algorithms. It's really interesting, again, so there's graph processing that is employed over here. And again, uh, we will talk about graph processing accelerators and they could be a good fit over here. And then you do assembly and there's multiple tools for it. Again, some of this is graph based, some of it's not. We're, we're, we may talk about it later on. And then you do read mapping, which is what we have discussed, actually. We've actually discussed only this part of the step over here. And then you may, you may find out that you're not accurate enough. So you actually may need to do polishing. Polishing has its own tools. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, basically here you, you, you form a draft assembly. Basically, it's a draft uh, genome uh, that's put together from reads. 
And then you do the read mapping across a, a, to a reference, as I discussed earlier, uh, such that you actually improve your confidence in the assembly. And then here, uh, you basically say, okay, I I'm confident or not confident, so let me do some more polishing to improve the assembly. So it's actually a very long pipeline. And this pipeline is discussed in the paper that I mentioned over here. Uh, if you're interested, you can actually learn a lot from that paper. And you can see that there are multiple bottlenecks over here. Nanopore, for example, base calling is a big bottleneck today. Uh, but read mapping is still important bottleneck, uh, as we've discussed earlier. So uh, uh, the, the pipeline is actually much longer. So the task is even harder than I've discussed, but it actually spans a lot of different algorithms, as you can see in this picture. So, okay, let's recall our dream from 2007. Basically, our dream was uh, a device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time within a minute. We're still a long ways to go from here, even after uh, more than a decade of research. Energy efficiency is a key problem. Performance and latency is a key problem. I don't think you can do any analysis within a minute. Okay, I don't think you can do even single analysis within a minute, let alone any analysis. Even a single simplest analysis, let's say that, can we do it within a minute? No, we cannot do it within a minute, unfortunately, today. And the next one is security. Uh, that's something we need to think about, privacy and security. We haven't thought about that. But in the end, basically, we have a huge memory bottleneck. And that's one of the reasons we're not there yet. And that's why we're going to talk a lot about memory uh, in this course starting. I'm going to, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to give you an overview uh, of memory. And then we're going to go into details. But let me actually motivate. Actually, these slides were slides that I did not have in the last incarnation of this course, but I decided to add them because uh, why do we care sometimes it becomes a problem in these applications? Very, very interesting, actually. Like uh, uh, so, uh, when we were starting uh, our original uh, research on uh, pre-alignment filtering and also uh, accel acceleration of pre-alignment filters, some people all, uh, would always say, why do I care? I put it to the cloud, the cloud does it for me. And I can take two weeks, I can take one week, I can take a month. Cloud is good enough, right? This is very similar to the story that I told you about MIPS R2000, right? MIPS R2000 is good enough. And in order, super scalar, simple, extremely simple, five stage pipeline machine is good enough in 1980. Why do I need a better machine? So as a researcher or as an innovator, you will get these comments. And it's always good to look backward at some point and say, okay, here's why we care. I told you we should have cared. <laughs> okay, you didn't believe me, but maybe we should care and we should never ask this question ever again. And I will, I will actually, uh, I use these examples sometimes when I talk about science and education to people. Sometimes you should not necessarily ask some question in terms of why we care, uh, at least in a way that is destructive. In a way that's constructive, it's good actually. Why do we care? Okay, let's think about some applications. That's good. But it should not be asked in a way such that, okay, why do we care? Uh, let's kill this research. Because I don't care, the cloud is good enough. Right? If we actually said that, if nanopore sequencing technologies, uh, Oxford nanopore technologies, for example, said that, they wouldn't have invested in the research and in the devices. So clearly there's a good case why we care today. And this is just an example from 2020. I believe there are many, many reasons why we care as I motivated earlier. But in 2020, clearly something happened and we're in a tough situation and we really want to understand uh, uh, where, do, where is this virus coming from? Uh, is there an outbreak? Can we, uh, can we provide surveillance of it? And uh, again, uh, if you use it for a good purpose, this could be very good. Uh, and these devices turn out to be important, extremely important because you can actually at least do the sequencing relatively fast. Maybe your, all of your analysis cannot be done relatively fast. But if we actually were at a point where we could actually do the analysis on the device, it would be much better today, basically. So basically, uh, COVID-19 sequencing is very interesting today. Uh, it's important, and especially whole genome sequencing of, of COVID-19 is important because now you can detect the virus from a human sample, such as saliva or different fluids. You can understand the sources and modes of transmission of the virus. You can discover the genomic characteristics of the virus and compare it with better known viruses like the uh, original SARS virus, right? Uh, you can design and evaluate diagnostic tests. So you can do a lot actually if you understand. And understanding is really first step in genome analysis. And uh, there are actually two key areas of COVID-19 genomic research today. Uh, for, uh, the first area is to sequence the virus itself, genome of the virus itself, in order to track the mutations in the virus because there's reasonable evidence that there's some mutation going on. And we would like to understand how that's happening and uh, whether it's good or bad or uh, how, 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 how 
how it reacts with different sort of uh, drugs, let's say, uh, how, it, how it responds to different sort of drugs. You can see that this is massive amounts of data that you need to process actually. Uh, uh, I mean, in the brute force case, you could take all of the data that you have and you could compare it to all of the possible drug reactions database that you know, and that would be a lot of analysis, right? But clearly we're far away from that brute force analysis today, right? You need to be intelligent in terms of your analysis. Okay, so, uh, and, and the second uh, key area is to explore the genes of infected patients. Uh, and this analysis can be used to understand actually what's happening once the, why, uh, once the person gets infected with the virus, right? Why some people get more severe symptoms, uh, how is this thing, uh, thing how, how, why, why does it remain dormant in some people? Why does it not remain dormant in other people? Uh, can we help with the development of different treatments in the future, dot, dot, dot. So this is a slide actually from Oxford Nanopore. It's not a slide actually, it's from their website. Uh, they basically say, of course, this is their claim. I have not verified it. Uh, they basically say uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it takes about seven hours from the RNA sample you get uh, to answer. And uh, they don't qualify what the answer is, of course, right? It depends on the analysis you want to do. And this analysis, in my opinion, is very optimistic. You can see over here, the analysis is what takes one hour. Uh, PCR, all of the preparation steps clearly take a lot of time, and that's true. And I think there needs to be some effort to improve those steps, but I think that goes a little bit beyond computer architecture at this point. Sequencing itself, you can see that the sequencing device is very efficient. Uh, they say one hour. Uh, I will take issue with this analysis because it really depends on what kind of analysis you want to do. If you want to do a sophisticated analysis, it could take, it could take uh, weeks actually. Uh, okay, but basically even, even the simplest analyses take seven hours as you can see over here. Of course, this has some preparation steps over here uh, of the sample, et cetera. Uh, even if you discount all of that with the very, very optimistic, uh, assuming that this is all done for you somehow magically, you just do sequencing and analysis according to their very optimistic uh, assertions, it's two hours. It's not a minute. So two hours a minute have orders of magnitude difference still, right? So, okay. Okay, so if you're interested, you can actually read more about this on Oxford Nanopore Technologies website. This is one company, this is the company that has produced the nanopore sequencing. There are other long read technologies from PacBio uh, that's also interesting in my opinion. But basically this is the future going forward. And as an architect, it's always good to dream about the future. And uh, if you're interested, we can actually, we're actually going to cover part of this talk later on. But if you're, uh, if you're actually not uh, patient enough, if you want to learn more about some of the algorithms that are employed, you can watch this keynote that I delivered. Mohammed also actually delivered several talks uh, that are building on this talk. So you can actually watch those as well. But we're going to cover a little bit more. But uh, let me go back to the axiom. I think if you want to solve a problem uh, that is of the difficulty that I have discussed so far, you really need to take the expanded view of computer architecture. You cannot say, I'm going to just design algorithms. You cannot just say, I'm going to just design devices. You really need to expand across the stack and co-design across the hierarchy. And this is one really good example, in my opinion, genome analysis, where we are discovering this, or we have already discovered this, but, but some other people are discovering this. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, that's another area. Graph processing, graph analytics is another area. So there are these key applications that are right now either employed or going to be employed, or we don't know if they will be employed, but if someone actually employs them, the future will change hopefully in a very positive way. Uh, and it's good to take this axiom and actually do the, anal uh, do, do the studies to uh, design uh, uh, algorithms, applications, and uh, software, and ISA, and the devices all the way down. Basically, algorithm architecture, uh, device co-design. As I said, this axiom applies well to genome analysis, and I think algorithm architecture, device co-design is critical. So uh, before I take a break, uh, because we're going to start the next phase of the lecture, which is really going to focus on memory, let me introduce you another example of this. And I think uh, I'm actually proud of this work. This is led by uh, Damla, who uh, is my PhD student, but it's also uh, a lot of my PhD students and postdocs are involved in it, including some of the past pre uh, PhD students like Lavanya. Uh, but basically, uh, we wanted to push the state of the art in terms of, again, this al algorithm architecture device code design. And we wanted to target approximate string matching, because as I said, approximate string matching is, that it is really at the core of such analyses. 
it's really employed for potentially pre-alignment filtering. It's employed in edit distance computation. It could be employed in text analysis. Ignore all of the things that I've talked about by informatics. You want to analyze two different pieces of text and look at the similarity of them. You really want to do approximate string matching. And that kind of text corpus analysis is actually important in some cases uh, on web search, for example, but you know, on many, many other searches that you need to do on text. Uh, actual speech recognition can actually employ some of that also, uh, which we can talk about later on if needed. So uh, approximate string matching is really a fundamental uh, primitive that is important to accelerate. And we actually had that uh, thought. And this is a paper that's going to be published officially uh, in next month at Micro, which was one of the top conferences. Let me give you an overview of this very, very quickly. Uh, we may assign this as a required reading, we may not, uh, but this, this gives you a, a flavor of the state of the art. As I said, one of the goals in this course is really expose you to the state of the art, really the cutting edge. And I'm talking about a paper that's not even published yet, even though you can find it on the internet because we put stuff early on. So basically multiple steps of read mapping require approximate string matching and approximate string matching is even more broader than that. It enables read mapping to account for sequencing errors and genetic variations. And it makes up a significant portion of read mapping. Uh, you can see there's some numbers associated with it, more than 70%. Uh, it's one of the major bottlenecks of genome sequence analysis in the end. So our goal in this work was to accelerate approximate string matching by designing a fast and flexible framework, which can be used to accelerate multiple steps of the genome sequence analysis pipeline. And I'm not going to go into detail. It's really algorithm, architecture, uh, hardware co-design. But I'm going to look at the hardware over here. But you can see the hardware over here. Uh, this is uh, the distance calculation uh, accelerator over here. It takes the reference text and query pattern. You can think of it as the reference genome pieces and reads. And then it basically compares them somehow and generates some bit vectors. Uh, and it basically passes those bit vectors to some other accelerator, which does some other heavy lifting, which is really uh, doing this traceback function for sequence alignment. This is really uh, the dynamic programming part uh, with uh, bit vectors over here in this case. But basically it does a uh, trace back step. It's, it's the hardest part in my opinion uh, in the design. It's, it's the hardest part to parallelize also. Uh, and in the end design is bottleneck partly by this. Uh, but basically it's still accelerating uh, this trace back step. So you have two different types of accelerators and their architectures are different because they actually tackle different types of algorithms. This basically tackles uh, the approximate distance calculation between strings and produces bit vectors. This takes the bit vectors and basically says, okay, this is where the errors are. This is where an insertion is. This is where a deletion is. This is where a mismatch is. And the algorithms are different. As a result, the hardware architecture design is different. For example, the first uh, accelerator, the uh, distance calculator is really a systolic array. It's a linear cyclic systolic array. As I mentioned earlier, machine learning accelerators are also systolic arrays. So there are similarities to those machine learning accelerators. Of course, there are some specialized things that we do over here to really, really specialize uh, the systolic array to the uh, BITAP algorithm that we use as our, uh, use and enhance as our approximate string matching algorithm. So this is very specialized. That's why it's extremely efficient actually. And the traceback accelerator is very different. Also, uh, you can see that uh, actually the output of this accelerator is uh, input of the next accelerator which is this traceback SRAMs over here, as you can see, there are intermediate bit vectors. And this traceback accelerator takes the intermediate bit vectors from GenASMDC, as you can see over here, and basically it looks at, it does bitwise comparison and figures out a scoring function. Basically it's called a cigar string also. These fancy words actually in bioinformatics are a little bit uh, downside of bioinformatics in general. People actually come up with these fancy words. But what this really means is where do these uh, two strings differ and what kind of uh, edits do you have? Insertions, deletions, mismatches. That's the idea over here. And you basically do this for every single read that you get out of a genome. And you could plug this device. So it turns out this device is actually under the logic layer, uh, not this device, this accelerator is under the logic layer of 3D stack memory because that makes things much more efficient. We want, you don't want to be bottlenecked by data movement from memory. As a result, we put this uh, accelerator, both of the accelerators in the logic layer such that the data access to main memory is not a big bottleneck. Uh, and uh, energy is very low and performance is very high. I'm not gonna talk about the performance energy results, but you can see that sometimes it goes to three orders of magnitude compared to the state-of-the-art software solutions. And it's, it goes to two or to three orders of magnitude faster and more efficient compared to uh, state-of-the-art hardware solutions also. 
So if you're if this piques your interest, uh, uh, feel free to discuss it and feel free to talk to us about it. But this is an example of the state of the art of what you could potentially do if you actually understand the principles and fundamentals that hopefully a lot of which we will cover in this course. Okay, this is a slide that's repeated basically. We call this huge bottleneck. We have a huge bottleneck of memory. And I believe that's what's really limiting us from uh, constructing this device, at least architecturally. That's why we're gonna focus a lot on this huge memory bottleneck uh, later in this lecture. This is a motivating part of the lecture. And in the rest of the uh, lectures, we're gonna talk about memory bottleneck as it affects these, at least these three key things. Uh, security, reliable safety, energy efficiency, how to make things more memory centric, and low latency and predictable. So that's why we're going to talk about memory and storage. But before I uh, start the next phase of the lecture, let me see if there are any uh, questions. And I will also take uh, a short break. Any questions based on what I've covered? Okay, I don't hear anything, but I cannot also see if people are raising hands. So if you, if you are raising hands or if you have any questions, please shout at this point because it's not easy for me to see if people are raising hands and my computer is not very responsive, frankly. Okay, I guess I don't see uh, any hands raised, uh, but feel free to uh, uh, have discussion online. Let's at this point take, uh, let me see, a 10 minute break. Let's be back at 2.25, and then we're going to start uh, with uh, the trends and opportunities in memory and storage.